I think your family failed you. I think society failed you. But I also am here to tell you, in the considered judgment of this court, a troubled and disturbed youth cannot serve as an excuse for cold-blooded, premeditated murder. They all drank each other's blood. They didn't drink the blood of the victims. The murder victims, but yes. They did this ritual thing where they drank each other's blood. They said it made them feel and have senses of the feelings they hadn't felt before. It was crazy. This is a case that not only gripped Central Florida, it went worldwide, way before the internet. It was that sensational. This was the statement voiced by a veteran reporter, Frank Stanfield. He was one of the large numbers of reporters who covered this unreal and unbelievable vampire cult murder story, which shook not just America, but the whole world. Who had gone to Eustis High with Heather before moving back to his home state of Kentucky. This case made international news. There were German TV crews, all the local media, and the court TV covering the trial and events of this horrific case. A special press room was set up for everybody to be able to cover the trial. It was really kind of a three ring circus. But what is this vampire cult leader story? Who is Rod Farrell? What were the vampire murders? How did Farrell's case shake out in court? Did they really drink human blood? And were they actual vampires? But while Farrell's outward appearance and behavior made the case the subject of bizarre headlines, investigators said, Answers to all these questions lie inside the events of this blood-curting gothic story, which inspired the veteran reporter Frank to write a book on it called The Mind of a Vampire. And this is not fiction. The story contains details from the case that some might find disturbing. With that warning, let's dive right into this bizarre crime from Central Florida. Rod Farrell was a 16-year-old boy from Murray, Kentucky, whose delusions led him to lead a ritualistic cult and brutally murder a 14-year-old member's parents in their home. He became the youngest to be on death row until his sentence was reduced to life prison with no parole. But to understand the story and make some sense of it, you need to know the events in the history from where he wasn't even born. And to convince yourself that this story is real, you need to follow Rod's life from his early childhood. I think you're a disturbed young man. I think your family failed you. That is his opinion. Everybody has the right to say whatever they think. Roderick did not have an easy life growing up. He was born to his then 16-year-old mom Sandra Gibson on March 28, 1980 in Murray. His father abandoned him to serve in the military and was never a part of his life. His maternal grandfather allegedly sexually abused him when he was around five years old. However, no criminal charges against the grandfather were ever pursued. Sandra and Rod did not have a stable home life bouncing back and forth between living with Sandra's parents and public housing. Sandra worked as an exotic dancer and sex worker to make ends meet. She introduced Rod to vampires and the macabre from a young age. They bonded over Dracula films and Vampire, the masquerade comic books. Sandra was far from an ideal mother and had a questionable and complex relationship with her son. At the age of 34, she was even caught writing disturbing love letters to a 14-year-old boy. I long to be near you, for your embrace. Yes, to become a vampire, a part of the family, immortal and truly yours forever. I only hope that one day you will once again return to Murray. You will then come for me and cross me over, and I will be your bride for eternity and you my sire wrote Sandra Gibson in the letter. The rest of the vampire clan's members came from equally depressing and disturbing situations. The most notable members were Scott Anderson, Rod's right-hand man, Chastity Kesey, his then 16-year-old girlfriend, Dana Cooper, a friend for the ride, and Heather Windorf, 
Rod's damsel in distress and who also turned out to be the victim ahead in the story. All of them took comfort in being able to belong to a group of outsiders and like-minded people while growing up in a place that is generally unaccepting of anything non-traditional. The gang's meetup spot was called the Vampire Hotel. It was a dilapidated structure in the middle of the woods near Kentucky Lake, in the land between the lakes. It was here. The clan threw parties, used psychedelic drugs, and took part in various types of rituals. Hearing stories from Heather about suffering abuse at the hands of her father struck a chord with Rod. After Heather had to move away, Rod became obsessed with the situation and ended up racking up hundreds of dollars in long-distance phone bills for Heather's family. The final straw for Roderick was when Heather's parents finally cut her off from the phone. It was then he rallied his group to go on the fateful rescue mission to save Heather from her parents and run away to New Orleans to start their very own unique vampire family and live happily ever after. Unfortunately, things did not go according to the plan. I asked her, I said, since you've spoken so much about killing your parents over the past year, I was like, do you still want me to? And what, what did she say? She said, yeah. On November 25, 1996, Rod and the gang made the 750-mile drive from Murray, Kentucky to Eustis, Florida. After she had been picked up and their vehicle had broken down, Heather made a deal with Rod in which she would use her keys to unlock her home so that her family's vehicle could be stolen and the clan could complete their trip to New Orleans. In exchange, Rod agreed to perform the turning ritual in which she would consume his blood and officially be a vampire forever. The ritual took place early that morning in a Eustace cemetery. Rod consumed a significant amount of LSD before Heather admitted to drinking Roderick's blood from a self-inflicted razor blade wound. Shortly after that, the group departed to retrieve the car from Heather's house. Upon arriving at the Windorf residence, Roderick and Scott entered the house through the garbage to find Mr. Windorf peacefully resting on the living room couch. After many moments of silence and deliberation, Mr. Windorf awoke to his skull being violently smashed in by Roderick and the crowbar Rod had brought in with him. Mr. Windorf suffered from more than 22 blows to his face. Hearing the noisy disturbance, Mrs. Windorf entered the living room from the kitchen. She was struck and left horrified at the sight of her husband being beaten to death by intruders. In an attempt to interrupt the despicable act, she splashed scalding hot coffee on the face of Roderick, who retaliated with the crowbar blow to her face. The blow was so hard that it severed her brain stem and killed her instantly. By that time, you know, it was pretty obvious. I had blood on me and a crowbar in my hand. I was fixing to say, yeah, I want to have coffee with you, son of a bitching smartass. But anyway, then that's when she lunged at me. I just took the bottom of the crowbar and kept stabbing it through her skull and whenever she fell down, I just continually beat her until I saw her brains falling on the floor, cause that pissed me off," said Roderick about the killing. My thoughts and feelings at the time of the incident, in fact for that entire time period during the course of that year, were perhaps more so elevated than your average individual to the point that it's incomprehensible to someone that could not have been there themselves. Afterward, Roderick and Scott proceeded to ritualistically burn their victims and dance around their bodies as they lay dying on the living room floor. Before leaving, they stole valuables such as jewelry and credit cards and eventually left in the family's Ford Explorer. The bodies were later discovered by Heather's 17-year-old sister, Jennifer. She had returned home from work that night. On the other hand, Heather assumed that everything had gone according to the plan and she was unaware of her parents being murdered until later when she was informed by the vampire gang. 
Murder warrants were put out for the group of teens on November 27, and after four days of evading the law enforcement, and after they tracked a phone call made by Chastity when she had called her grandparents asking for money, the vampire gang was finally captured on November 28th. At first, Roderick completely denied the accusations, claiming he was being framed by a rival vampire gang. But eventually, with an overwhelming amount of evidence piled against him, he pled guilty. He received two charges of first-degree murder, robbery, and burglary, and was sentenced to death. This made him the youngest American to ever be on death row. Scott Anderson received two life sentences in prison. The amount of his involvement in the murders came under question, though he claims that he never touched Mr. or Mrs. Windorf and attempted to calm a raging Roderick, who proceeded to go crazy and bash their skulls in with a crowbar. Charity Kesey and Dana Cooper made plea deals in exchange for reduced sentences. Charity was sentenced to 10 years in prison and Dana for 17. They were later released from prison in 2008 and 2015 respectively. Scott's sentence was recently changed in 2018 to 40 years, crediting the 22 years he has already spent in prison. By the time Scott Anderson will be released in 2032, he will be 51 years old. All went to prison on various charges. Howard Scott Anderson is scheduled for release in 2031. Dana Cooper was released in late 2011, and Charity Kesey was released in early 2006. In 2000, Roderick Farrell's death sentence was changed to life prison after the Florida Supreme Court ruled defendants must be 17 years old or older at the time charges are filed in order to be able to get executed. To this day, Roderick remains at the Tomoka Correctional Institution, serving out his life sentence. He was the first defense witness in the resentencing hearing for Rod Farrell, the man who once claimed to be a 500-year-old vampire and leader of a teen cult that drank blood. But the story does not end here. Rather, it's the beginning of scandalous revelations into the world of goths and vampires, made by Roderick himself during and after his trial. Roderick was interviewed and questioned by people from several professional backgrounds. Lawyers, journalists, reporters, writers, filmmakers, and even TV show creators wanted some parts of the story from Roderick. Everybody wanted to know how this criminal vampire cult went on with its operations. What rituals they believed in and carried out. How could something this unusual and strange be a reality of their surroundings? Everyone wanted to know everything about this case, and with time, the insights and information revealed into the mind of a vampire were monstrous. Now I'm just Satan himself, so not that I really care. Frank Stanfield, the veteran reporter, revealed that at one time, Rod actually believed that he was a vampire. Frank adds to this, saying that in a lot of cases, he was fascinated with the gothic vamp lifestyle and convinced all those other members of the cult. He was able to manipulate other people to join his group because they were fascinated by whatever he said. Even before police began searching for Farrell and the others after the gruesome double murder, the so-called vampire had already been under investigation. According to court documents from the time, Farrell had apparently once forced his way into an animal shelter in Murray, Kentucky. Once inside, he allegedly proceeded to attack dozens of dogs, killing two and injuring another so badly that it had to be euthanized. That's what a sanguinary vampire is, a blood feeder. Perhaps the most bizarre aspect of the case 
was the fact that Farrell believed he was a 500-year-old vampire named Visago. Farrell claimed he was part of a vampire cult and that the other members were part of a unique brotherhood. Farrell became obsessed with role-playing games at a young age. When he began playing Vampire the Masquerade with like-minded individuals, he developed a fascination with the idea of vampirism. By the time he was 16, Farrell had become a highly destructive young man. The teenager was not just using drugs, but had turned his bedroom into a shrine occult. Court documents claimed he had been observed taking part in satanic rituals and self-harm, going as far as to carve an upside-down cross onto his own chest. Everything I was listening to was dark. It was based upon hate, war, death, pain, that's all my music, all my movies that I watched. My bedroom was an array of the darker side of the occult, such as the Necronomicon, the Satanic Bible. I had upside down crosses. I had broken shards of glass laying about in the corner. I had hooks and metal cables wrapped around looking like Hellraiser, said Farrell in an interview with Crime Watch Daily. The couple's daughter Heather was arrested along with Farrell, Howard Scott Anderson, Dana Cooper, and Charity Kesey. If this couldn't be any more disturbing, Gibson, Farrell's mother, was charged with soliciting rape and soliciting sodomy on November 12, 1996. Gibson sent sexually explicit letters to a 14-year-old Jamie. Jamie's mother pressed charges after her son showed her the letters. She also found out that Gibson set up a shrine in her home with pictures of Jamie, candles, and incense. According to a December 2019 Daily Commercial article, Farrell made a tearful apology to the victim's families. I think his, his sense of guilt and remorse is profound. And... While incarcerated, Farrell took some classes and got a wastewater treatment license. Gibson said that a lot of women write to him. He's been married and divorced during the course of his imprisonment. His current fiance showed up at one hearing. She said that if released, she would take Farrell in and help him find a job. Gibson said that she was living with her mother, started a jewelry business, and is even considering attending church. Her father, Farrell's grandfather who assaulted him, has dementia and is living in a facility. As I've gotten older, I've learned that it's very important to live a decent life. You can really make a difference," stated Gibson. Mental health experts later testified in the resentencing hearing of Farrell that he is not a vampire cult leader anymore, and he has changed. Psychologists claim that Farrell was gang raped by his grandfather and his friends. Gibson's older sister testified during the trial in 1998 that her father had sexually abused both her and Gibson as well. Experts claim that Farrell was a child turned into a monster, that he was immature and still growing. Still, they add, it was no excuse for such criminal acts. Psychologist Heather Holmes testified that Gibson confronted the homeowner where the rape took place with five-year-old Farrell by her side. She thought she was sticking up for her son, but it re-traumatized him, Holmes said. I had decided to take the uh, darker path, the evil path. I found that more exciting. If it wouldn't have been the Windorfs, at the rate I was going, it would have been somebody. It's truly terrifying what people are capable of. What do you guys think? Would Roderick have committed these terrible deeds had he not been subject to so much trauma and torment? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you liked the video, hit the like button, share the video, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell icon for more such horrifyingly thought-provoking cases which are 100% real.